Hi, I'm Eric Holtzkoff, Chief Strategist at Liger, and you're listening to The Claw, which is the marketing podcast for C-suite executives. I'm joined today by Jody Grunden. He is with Summit Virtual CFO Services. So Jody and I are going to talk about those those dollars that are being spent, because like, you know, people always complain on the marketing side. It's, uh, are we spending enough? Are we not spending enough? Those types of things. So talk to me a little bit about work, your work at Summit. So like, what do you guys do in, in your world day to day? Yeah, great question. Thanks for having me, Eric. Uh, we are a virtual CFO service uh, firm. Uh, so we provide uh, virtual CFO services for creative agencies. And so the majority of the clients that we work with are creative agencies all across the United States and, and abroad. Um, our team is fully remote and has been for the last 10 years or so. So we're one of the first financial firms to ever be remote. And uh, so it allows us to really kind of service clients really anywhere um, from anywhere, and which makes it a really nice combination. So we work with clients on, right on a weekly basis, meeting with them, going through forecasting, budgeting, uh, going through the KPIs, really kind of helping them digest their financial statements. Marketing spend is definitely one of those and uh, really kind of help them grow. I didn't realize that you had a focus on creative agencies. So that's an interesting one to look at because I talk about the fact that in our world, I'm basically selling people and paper. Like that, that's all I got. I don't have tchotchkes of any type. I don't have a, you know, we're not selling food. So it's, you know, the people in the paper and I got to make enough money off the people in the paper to make sure that we, you know, keep the lights on and continue to grow. So that's an interesting focus. How did you, how did you decide to focus in that category? Yeah, great question. Um, well, we, it, from about 2004 through 2011, we were kind of the generalists doing kind of really anything that comes, comes around. And then we thought, you know, hey, why don't we start really kind of focusing on something that's more niche based and see exactly how that works. So we've always heard that, hey, the, the smaller you get in the niches, the, 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 better, you know, the faster growth will be. And so uh, Creative Agencies was what was actually our first true CFO client, in which we could not work with them. You know, they, they were outside of the state of Indiana, so we couldn't actually go to see them. So it was a true virtual concept. And it was a company out of Rhode Island. They were a creative agency. They were a Drupal, Drupal firm. Uh, did you know giant websites, and we and they were fully remote as well. So they were the first fully one of the first fully remote companies ever. And so we, we really liked the, how they did things. You know, it was kind of it was kind of one of those things that they they listened uh, versus a lot of doctors will listen or lawyers won't listen. You know, they they actually listened and kind of you know it, it was more of a team concept. And I thought, well, this is kind of a cool area. And then all of a sudden they started referring clients to us, and so we started getting other. Uh, creative agencies out there. And we started developing, you know, four or five of them. And then uh, we got an opportunity to uh, attend a, the, it was like, it was called Yonder. It was the first, one of the first uh, true remote conferences. And so we went there and there was 25 remote companies. A lot of them were creative agencies and a gentleman by the name of Carl Smith asked me, you know, hey, would you be interested in speaking in front of 30 agencies or so at a conference? And I thought, yeah, sure. Why not? And so I went down and they really talked about how to be profitable. Yeah. So that sounds like a great idea, right? You got 30 people who could potentially use your services. Not a bad idea, right? Yeah, exactly. And it, it kind of went from there. You know, they, uh, I, I kind of broke down the metrics on how to be profitable, what, what they need to look for. And uh, it just led to more and more and more. And eventually uh, we ended up with uh, over 100 creative agencies that we, uh, that we, uh, we work with uh, today, you know, out of the 200 plus, you know, 200 companies o- overall. Very cool. So I think we'll break this into then two segments because, you know, running a creative agency and I've, I've only in my career sold people in paper. So like my entire career services. So I've done professional services and always kind of like taking somebody's salary, marking it up enough, making sure you're getting the margin off of it, whatever, under research company for a period of time, which is all that. So when you start to work in those companies, like I'm curious, like common mistakes. What are some of the things that you see that you're like, oh, this is like a, a thing that I wish all of them knew so that they would just fix it from the beginning because it's really hard to either go back and correct or it's where they're probably losing the most money. Like what's what's your sage advice to those kind of groups? Yeah, I would say the number one thing really is it has anything to do with losing or making money, but it's more how much cash they have on hand. Um, we always tell clients that they really need to have at least 10% of their annualized revenue in the bank at all times. So if they're a $3 million agency, they should have $300,000 in the bank. Um, and that's the bare minimum. That's really to kind of make the world go around. Uh, we tell them that between 10 to 30%, 30%, meaning they'd have, you know, $900,000 in the bank, you know? So again, it's that, it's that variance there. 10% for those that are less risk taking, you know, 30%, oh, it'd be the opposite. 30% if you, if you, if you want less risk. 
more risk would be close to that 10%. There's a lot of variables that go in that. But 10% equates about two months of expenses. 30% equates to about six months. And everybody can do that mental math. And so instead of saying, hey, what's your, you know, how much cash should, should you need? Well, it's real simple. Just multiply it in your head real quick. And, and I would say that's probably the biggest mistake that a lot of agencies you know, go through is that they think that they've got to drain the cash to save taxes at the end of the year or whatever. And that's just a common false mistake uh, that, they, that they have. You really need that cash to really kind of build. And, and what the cash does is it allows you to make mistakes, right? I mean, if uh, you make a mistake, it, it's not going to kill you. If, right. if, a, if an accounts receivable is late, it's not going to, you know, it, it's not going to, it's not going to be the end of the world. Uh, so there's a lot of things that cash does that, you know, re- really, you know, th- that really, really helps, helps a business grow and helps the business manage their, their, their stuff. Um, I, I would say that one of the biggest things, you know, even through like COVID, when we, when we went through that, you know, a lot of our firms you know, had about 15% to 20% cash on hand. And so it allowed them to kind of sit back, digest things before they reacted. And it really took a lot of emotion out of it. So I, I would say cash is by far the number one thing that, a business of any size, service-based marketing doesn't make any difference what it is that they need to at least have that 10% buffer in there. And then, uh, you know, up to 30% would be great, um, you know, for, for various reasons. Yeah. A- amen. So that's such an important thing to pay attention to. And then knowing that, uh, there's no specifically when you're in that relationship of being a creative agency and you have people who were maybe contractors who are working for you, you know, they get expect to get paid sooner and your companies you're working with may take, sometimes they lose an invoice. It takes them 60 days or they slow pay you for some reason or whatever. So like, how do you make it through that in a way that lets you sleep at night? <laughs> so, right. Oh, hundred percent. You know, and, and you kind of brought up a good point, you know, that with the invoicing thing, we, we tell our clients to always call, um, especially on new engagements, always call the, the, uh, the client's uh, uh, AP department before, the actual first invoices that you even do. And, and we do that just so that they can clarify that, hey, did you get everything signed? Did, did everything go through right? Do you have the right address? Do you have the right terms? And, and it's, it's a friendly call. It's not a after the fact, where's my money call? It's just right. kind of setting things up. And, and that solves a ton of issues because you know what happens a lot of times, especially on new engagements, um, maybe something didn't get signed correctly. So you're waiting for that, bill, you know, that payment to come in from that invoice. It doesn't come in. You give them like 15 days because you don't want to rock the boat at all. And then it gets there and then something happens, you're 30 days out and then you call them and they're like, well, you forgot to sign a document or something, something really simple. And then it starts that whole process over again where they get their money so far out. And so with invoicing, we highly recommend calling clients in advance of that first invoice, especially for new clients, just to make sure everything is right and kosher and everything is you know, on, in line to uh, get, get payment processed in, time, in a timely manner. Yeah, that's really smart. I um I've always had an accounts receivable person who's been very, very good at collections for us. And it is about that establishing the relationship and just making sure everything's good. You know, like not the, Hey, where's my money and harassing thing. And that's how you get the bigger companies, which is often, so I work with companies that don't understand how they can't get above a certain level. Like they're like, Oh, we just can't get above this revenue level. And it's typically because they don't know how to manage the relationship with those larger clients. And you know, massage that they, you got to have enough cash. You got to have the right finesse. So it's as much a sales job as selling the deal to begin with, to make sure the money comes into the bank later. So, yeah. So, yeah. So then, um, looking beyond that, so cash completely makes sense. So then, you know, are you paying attention to, you know, headcount or looking at like profitability for per person or is it per project? Like, how do you, how do you, what, what's kind of one of another thing you might consider or want to look at? Yeah, so there, there's the four metrics that we talk about mostly. The first one's that cash. We talked about that a little bit, 10% of the annualized revenue, but also having an amount for, uh, for taxes. I'd say 40% of your bottom line should be set aside for taxes. So based on that, that's the cash portion of it. The second portion is the, the production metrics. And the production metrics would be like your utilization and average bill rate. Uh, those are the two real key factors that drive, or the two levers that everyone has to drive success. And what, what, does, what does that mean? Well, the average bill rate, let's start with that first of all. Uh, that is your, you know, you've got your standard rate. That's the amount that you, quote, you, you put on your quotes. Well, the average bill rate is what you actually realize. And so, you know, not often do you actually realize everything that you put out there dollar-wise. And so you might be billing at $200 an hour, but because you ran over on projects, maybe that comes out to $175 an hour. So that's what the average bill rate is. Uh, the other thing is the utilization. So utilization is the time spent working on projects. 
And so we find that a typical agency is going to work probably 32 hour ish uh, per week on a, on, a, on a project. And so that, that 32 divided by 40 is going to be your percentage, your utilization percentage. Now that's assuming that they're working on projects 32 hours a week throughout the, the whole thing, throughout the whole year with no breaks and everything. Well, that's not going to happen. You've got, you know, your, your PTO time, you've got, you know, time off, you've got all the variable things, education that you can't actually work on projects. And so that naturally the utilization will, will drop. And we, we see that our typical clients will average about 59 to 58% utilization rate which means that 58% of the time that they're working, they're working on projects that are actually getting built out to clients. And so those are two real key things that you have to really manage. And you might ask, well, what, what is the average or why is that important? And there's really no important, for, there's no average that I would say that every agency out there should take. They really have to kind of look inward and figure that out themselves. You know, what does their company culture look like? And, and then what does their average bill rate need to be in order to, you know, for the client base they're looking for? And then you need to forecast that out there and see if it works. You know, often they, what they'll do is they'll just they'll guess or they'll figure it out. And, and, they're, and they're not looking so much in the, in the future. They maybe have the project or whatever, and they kind of build a bad model. And so you have to really kind of forecast that out on a monthly basis, see what that should be in order and so that you can kind of track it uh, going forward and kind of compare where you're, where you're doing right and doing wrong. And it's not a, you know, utilization average bill rate is not a, beat everybody up over the head if we're not hitting different things. It's more of a guide to actually tell you, hey, is my process and system working well? And can I look forward and see that it's going to be able to build the cash that I need in order to run the business successfully? Very nice. And there's a, I have a bunch of, um, I'd be interested to see what your, what you think an ideal stack is, because I use all kinds of things to make that work. I've got these custom spreadsheets I've used that like, tell me, do help me do the cash flow, look at our, you know, expected versus whatever. We've got these bill rate spreadsheets, you know, rack rate versus long terms and all those kind of things, but they're all custom. Like it's all custom work that I've done on the back end to figure out the formulas and get there. And then talking about, you know, tracking time you know, we do it to just, I tell everybody at the beginning of the week, we've got X number of hours to spend on behalf of our clients. It's like a factory. Like, and so these are the hours we need to allocate towards our clients. And then if we do that, then the rest of it is available for the other things that we need to do. And we're covering our expenses and making, a, making a profit. So it's a interesting thing to look at because it's a little, it's a little different than like the manufacturing plant that opens up and has to get enough tchotchkes out. <clears throat> you know, you're thinking about people and people are imperfect and <laughs> things happen and all yeah. that kind of stuff. So, you know, time's always one of those things that people always talk about, right? Why do we track time or should we track time? You know, all that kind of stuff. Some folks bill by the hour and, and, and they're doing time and material building. And, that, and that's perfectly fine. If they want to go that route, that's great. You know, with what we do, we do subscription-based billing or we do flat fee billing. And there's a lot of folks that do that as well. And then they're asked, well, if we're doing that, why are we tracking time? And, and I, always, I always fall back and say, well, the reason why you track time is not because we're going to bill clients that time. It's not because we're going to hold you against that time or kind of look for reasons that you're, you're doing right or wrong. We're looking for the different things that we can educate people on and kind of help them upward. You know, it, it's kind of funny because even with our own processes, we've got all these different processes in place. We're an e we're, we're an myth subscriber. You know, we've got processes for everything. And, and with that, you know, time is one of those things that, you know, we, we, we look back and say, you know, hey, why is it taking Eric double the time that it's taking Bob? You know, is there a reason? So we can kind of dig into that a little bit and say, oh, Eric's not using the same software that Bob's using. Maybe he doesn't know about it. And so then we talk to Eric, hey, did, you know, use this. And, and then boom, there's, their, their time starts coming down a little bit. You know, it, and it allows us to look at different areas like that for improvement. And it's, it's, it's amazing that, you know, we've got all these talented CFOs out there that we have on the team and, and they're all really great with spreadsheets. And, and the problem with spreadsheets is you can't really scale spreadsheets. They're really, it, it, you can't do it. And then we'll have occasionally we'll have a couple that, fall back to the spreadsheet because that's a very that's their most common thing. But the problem with spreadsheet, again, it, it breaks down. It's more time consuming um, because you're always fixing errors and, and that sort of thing. And so, you know, we, we can notice things like that and kind of educate up, which is important. Um, you know, the, the pricing is also important. You know, without time, it's hard to know how, how if you're pricing things properly or not. You know, you can kind of guess, you know, things are going really, really, really well. Probably don't need to even worry about it. But it's when things don't go well, that's when you need to kind of be able to dig in. And times are really your only resource that you have available to, to do any kind of analysis on things. So, you know, I, 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 I'm, all for, I'm all for not tracking time. I wish there was a way that we could do it. We didn't track time. 
but we use time as a tool to really kind of educate and, and to kind of help our team. Agreed. Agreed. So we're going to go to first commercial break and when we get back, we'll continue the conversation I'm talking today with Jody Gundon. He is with summit virtual CFO services. You're listening to the claw. I'm Eric Holtz claw chief strategist at Liger. And we'll be back in just a minute. The claw podcast is brought to you by Liger partners. Liger partners is a premier marketing firm where we save the world from boring, broken marketing. We get underdogs recognition because you deserve it. For more information, go to LigerPartners.com and follow us on all social media platforms at Liger Partners. And we're back. You're listening to The Claw. I'm Eric Holtzclaw, Chief Strategist at Liger. The Claw is the marketing podcast for C-suite executives and agencies who service those people because we are one of those. Uh, primarily working in B2B. And I'm talking today with Jody Grundon. He is with Summit Virtual CFO Services. And so, Jody, one of the things I'm interested in to see how you get into this, because, you know, so we have a bunch of clients and we do their marketing and we're a creative agency and all those types of things. And we'll have our clients come to us and we, we're more and more, specifically when we work with them for a while, start to look at the ROI, like the return, right? So as an agency, like what are some of the things that we may need to be prepared for on our side to, like how can we better be, pre- be better prepared for that question? Is there some things that we could have in place to, to make sure that we can tell our client, hey, this is what you're getting for your stuff? Yeah, so, so basically with, when, we look at a, when, we look at a, when we look at a client itself, we want to say that, hey, they want to spend between 7 to 11% on average of their uh, revenue on marketing. So 7% to 11%. I includes- feel like I have fed you answers because I tell everybody this. I say 7 to 12. 7, it's maintenance. And 12 means we're like maybe doing some brand things and like we're kind of hyping it up this year. So that, but yeah, that's the number I've always used. So good. I'm glad to hear that. I love it when an accountant says it because I'm, I am a street smart guy. I did not like accounting in school. <laughs> so anyway, so sorry, I, I broke your chain of thought, but keep going. So yeah. No, so, yeah. no, no. Like, like for instance, like, like right now, typically we will spend 7% a year on our marketing and that generates inbound marketing. So we're never going outbound. We're not doing a, a lot of the outbound marketing where we're going at people. They're coming to us. And so that 7% generates that. When we when we're going to, like you had mentioned, we when we want to go into a high growth mode, like this year, we're actually focusing more on eleven percent. So we're spending another four percent on marketing to generate, you know, additional revenue for that. And so the key is depending upon where they're at in their cycle is is where how much money they want to spend, you know, in that. And the marketing budget is the overall marketing, right? So it's every it's basically your marketing, and it's all we also include your business development in that marketing budget. So we include both that too. So it could be people, it could be outsource companies. It could be really anything that's going into that, that budget. So seven to 11% is typically what we, what we see. And if they're not spending that, then that's could be one of the reasons why they're not growing uh, as fast as that they, they were hoping to. Okay. Yeah. That's a great, that's awesome. I love that that maps to, it's, I feel like I like gave you a hundred bucks before we started to tell you to say that answer. Cause that's what I always <laughs> talk to people about. <laughs> and so um, in the, in the marketing category of, you know, working with firms around kind of measuring the effectiveness. So what are some of the important things I need to make sure I have in place to measure the effectiveness of my marketing spend? Well, you want to look at your growth year over year. So, uh, so that's the, that's going to be the key there. So looking at your growth year over year and taking that and dividing that into the actual marketing spend. And so you want your marketing spend always to be, um, less than what your, your long-term va- or lifetime value of your client. And there's a formula that goes into that. And you really kind of need to know what the lifetime value of the client is and then what the marketing spend is. And it's, and it's got to be um, you know, about 25 to 30% of that over time. And so that's, that's a big factor. But in, in order for you to have that, you've got to have the information. You've you got to have the data in order to do that calculation because it's a, it is a very extensive calculation. And um, it, it's going to be really important to know that in order to determine exactly that dollar amount to spend you know, for your return. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I tell people specifically about this business that it's just a big old calculator. Like, it's like, this place is just a big old calculator. Like, stuff comes in, stuff goes out. We got numbers. We got to hit them, da, 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 da. Um, how, what, I think for a lot of companies, one of the harder things to do is to forecast. You know, like, what's the future going to look like? You know, and, and you can understand cash a little bit because you got, you know, what your AR and your AP is and, you know, how long maybe retainers are in place or whatever. Are there any best practices around, like, what forecast, how to forecast, like, what we might be able to do at the top line or 
Yeah, forecasting is, is crucial for business. So forecasting, you need to know what utilization rate is, you know what your average bill rate is, number of full-time equivalents that you have. And you need to be able to look at and break out a month by a month look at that to determine revenue. So average bill rate times, you know, your, your utilization, you know, times, you know, the, um, you know, the, the number of full-time equivalents is going to come out to the dollar amount that you need if you take that by the, the number of hours in the month and so forth. So there's a, there's a calculation for that as well. But the key though is, is to be able to know what that capacity is. So when you're, when you're building a forecast, you always build it on the team's capacity. So here's the team I have in place. Here are the hires I'm going to make in the future. Here's what that total capacity is going to be at the average bill rate that you're looking at. And then you extrapolate that from month to month. So every month's going to have a separate goal, um, you know, a separate revenue goal. And so then with that, once you've established that revenue goal, the next step is looking at your uh, actual costs related to it, the direct costs related to it, which are typically going to be your people costs, you know, because people is what we, we drive revenue with, you know, especially right. in the marketing agencies. And so we drive that, that, that cost should be no more than 50% of your revenue. And so you're looking at, a gross profit margin of about 50%, meaning revenue minus direct costs related to the production, which is all your, your, your again, your, your pulling production costs and their burden. So that would be, you know, their 401k, their health insurance, everything that's involved in that person should be up above the line there. And so you got that 50% mark there. And then from there, you're looking at the difference in the rest of the costs that are related to it. So you're looking at your administration costs, you're looking at facility costs, which should be about 4% of your revenue. You're looking at, you know, we already talked about marketing between seven to 11%. Uh, overall overhead between administration, marketing, and facility should be no more than 35%. And so that will drop about 15% to your bottom line. And we say that 15% should be the target for, the, for most companies in the service based businesses. 10% bottom line should be break even or bare minimum. You really can't do it. If you're, if you're forecasting lower than 10%, then you know, it, you're going to struggle. Cash wise, you're going to struggle big time. So 10% is kind of that break even, 15% should be the target. And the, and the successful companies are doing closer to 20 to 25% because they figured out how to leverage things a little bit better. Maybe their, maybe their production costs are only 45%. So they gained another 5% there at the top line. Maybe they're, maybe they're doing it on you know, 8% marketing instead of 11%. Or, you know, so they're, they're, you know, everything's kind of like, here are the different pennies you've got to make up $100. How are we going to divide everything up? Because you, you, you've got to take, you give and take from different areas there. And so, you know, the, the important part is once you've actually established those revenue at the top, then it's very, fairly easy to go ahead and establish the numbers going, you know, going you know, at the bottom, bottom part of it, and then extrapolating that over the period of a year. And then the key there is not just letting it go. And so a lot of folks, you know, they'll, they'll do this exercise in November and they'll, they'll spend a lot of time, get budgets and all that kind of stuff, and then they won't touch it ever again until the next year. And how did we do? Oh, those people are insane. I touch that spreadsheet every day. The most open spreadsheet on my desktop is my, it's called analysis. It's like the analysis of the company. And I am updating it literally sometimes two or three times a day. I'm like in there, okay, we moved this, that got moved over. Yeah, always looking at it. And you've got to do it at least on a monthly basis. And on a monthly basis, after the books are closed, everything's closed for that month because that's going to change and affect that forecast now going forward because the forecast shouldn't just be the revenue and the expense side, but it also should be the cash side. You know, what's my cash looking like in November? You know, am I going to be low in cash because of the way that revenue and expenses fall? Do I need to make adjustments today that can impact November? So I'm not worrying about that. And, and so that's the strategies that you play with the, with the forecast because you're making those proactive decisions today versus super reactive in November, you're like, oh, what happened to my money? You know, yeah. Am I doing something wrong? Right. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You should have planned yeah. for it. That, yeah. That's the key forecasting. Yeah, and the bigger challenge, too, is that you run into, and the world is better now because we, we're we built like a bow tie, so we have liger ligers and we have liger diggers, and so there are people who are like full-times, and then we have contractors we'll use, and that's been good because it helps us to expand because you have this problem of, like, you bring on a client, now you may need a new team, but you don't have enough of a client for a full new team, right? So, like, that moving out of certain sweet spots where you're like, oh, these are, this is a really profitable spot. Now we're going to move up. And then in the move up, you're like, oh, wow, this hurts <laughs> for this period of time while we're trying to get parts of people and put them in places and build new teams. That is the most painful part of that process. So, yeah. yeah. Well, well, that's, that's, the, that's the importance of the pipeline, you know, con, you know pipeline numbers because pipelines are fourth metric ways to talk about, and you've got to look at your contract capacity. What do you have under contract? 
And what is the capacity of your team? You, you built your capacity based on people, you, average bill rate utilization, and you spread that across. That's your capacity. But here's what I got under contract. And it's saying that, you know what? We thought we we're going to have $300,000 in revenue in February. And right now we only have 250. Well, typically we make up 25,000, let's say, throughout every month, just things that come in and, you know, at the last minute. So we know we're going to be short. You know, what do we do there? Well, we have to reduce our, our, our forecast, right? And so we look at the next three months and we do that. And to your point, you know, it, it may be completely over. You may look at it and say, wow, we thought we we're going to do 300,000. We're built for 300,000, but really we've got contract to do 600,000. What do we do? You know, and we spread that over. And that's when you look at the contract, the contractors and say, hey, is this temporary or is this permanent? Do we need a temporary base to build a permanent base? And that's exactly where you're going with it. You know, it, that, that's, a, that's the nice thing to be able to leverage contractors that you can do that uh, versus having employees who are kind of stuck um, with, you know, hope, hoping that, hey, that, that's always a permanent increase versus a temporary adjustment when you, when you create that forecast. Very nice. Well, I've really enjoyed talking to you today. It's been great. Like it's confirmed some things that makes me want to go look at some of my spreadsheets too and be like, okay, is that the number I have or whatever? But yeah, so it's, it's really cool that you guys work in that space. So uh, thanks so much for joining me on the call today. Thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, so I've been talking today with Jody Grundon. He is with Summit Virtual CFO Services. They focus specifically on creative agencies, which is amazing. So they look at the people on paper and figure out how to make that work. Uh, you've been listening to The Claw, which is brought to you by Liger. Uh, which is our marketing podcast for C-suite executives. Thanks for tuning in.